Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. What's going on? This is your girl Tiffany coming through right here live in effect. So today I am going to be dealing with the topics about groups and organizations. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the League of Struggle for the Negro Rights. And the other one is going to be the National Negro Congress. Excuse me. Both of these organizations have been around and they are the predecessor of the revolutionary organization that we commonly know of, like the Black Panther, the New Liberation Party. Um, I mean, the new black, was it the Black Liberation Army and all these other revolutionary groups. So before they came about into the picture, these were the two groups that were pretty radical and they also spoke on the principle of, they also practiced the principle of communism. So they believed in the communism concept, right? And we're talking about in the 30s, okay? So communism has been a common practice amongst the black revolutionary organizations. And one day I'm gonna go into more details about why many black people uh, follow the concept of the communism and socialist party movement and why they incorporate into their philosophies and etc. But anyways, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started on that, but just give me a few moments and I'll be back. All right, I'm here. So we're going to be looking at the information about the League of the Struggle for Negro Rights. So let's look at it. I'm on blackpass.org website. Okay. So as you can see, it says abolish race, hatred, smash the color line. All right. 
So the lead of struggle for Negro rights was the primary civil rights organization of the American Communist Party during the mid to during to do. During the early to mid 1930s, founded in St. Louis in 1930s, after the dissolution of the American Negro Labor Congress, the group established regional branches throughout the nation, but was most most active in Harlem and Chicago, Illinois. B. D. Amos was the LSNR's first general secretary, followed by Harry Haywood in 1934. And Lansing Hughes was appointed as honorary president and served in that capacity until the organization disbanded in 1936. All right. So LS, LSNR, ostensibly worked towards the realization of the communist international radical 1928 resolution on the Negro question, which argued for land redistribution in the South and for African-Americans rights to self-determination through the creation of a sovereign nation state in the black belt. In practice, however, the LSNR focused lens on the theoretical right of self-determination and more on military mentally agitating for social and civil equality through its newspaper, The Liberator, and through direct action protests against lynching, tenant eviction, Jim Crow segregation, legal frame-ups, including the infamous Scott, Scott's Barrow rape trials and other manifestations of racial injustice. Reflecting the sectarian nature of the American Communist Party in the 19, in the early 1930s, the LSNR carried on a contentious feud with mainstream civil rights organizations like NAACP and Urban League, whom it branded Negro misleaders, although on a local level, LSNR branches demonstrated more willingness to engage in coalition politics. All right, and then goes on to say, despite its striding appeals for racial justice, the, L the LSNR never developed a mass following outside of Communist Party circle. National membership peaked at around 10,000 in the mid 1930s. Meanwhile, local branches outside of the core areas of Communist Party strength often faded as fast as they arose. The LSNR's limit appeal reflected both African-Americans general skepticism towards the Communist Party, and in particular, the party's idea of a separate Black nation, as well as the LSNR's own traditional ambiguity amid the numerous other CP-sponsored organizations fighting for racial justice, including the International Labor Defense, the Trade Union, Unity League, and the Unemployed Council. In 1936, as the Communist Party entered its popular front, period, party leadership decided to dissolve the LSNR and fold its resources into building the National Negro Congress, a remarkable coalition and uh, excuse me, desperate civil rights and labor organization under a unified program of liberal reform. The NNC held its first, first national convention in February 1936 and will serve as CP's primary vehicle for civil rights activism until anti-communist pressure forced it to disband in 1947. All right, so that's the history of the legal, the lead of the struggle for the Negro rights. So now I want to look at the founder or the what the uh, Secretary General Harry Haywood. So we're gonna look at his information in a moment, but let's go ahead and look at some collection. Okay. <clears throat> Whew. All right, so hopefully you can see my screen. All right, there we go. So let's look at this. Now, this is uh, the New York Public Library Digital Collection, okay? And it's called the League of Struggle for Negroes' Rights, which was created in 1936. So I'm going to zoom it in.
Hold on. I'm trying to I'm trying to zoom it in. All right, here it goes. So, so this is the um, this is the essay that was written in 1936 by the legal struggle for a Negro's right. Okay, so right here it says Charles uh, Comper Patch, January 14, 1936. Manhattan Borough Edition, Mr. Gray. It says, Lee of Struggle for Negro Rights. Among many Negroes association in the metropolitan area of New York City whose activities are outstanding in commenting better relation between cosmopolitan group was the League of the Struggle for Negro Rights with headquarters at 415 Lenox Avenue, New York City. This organization has been responsible for the change of front and attitude of those several groups and to a marked extent has made possible that humorous cohesion in the solidarity of our social order. And then it goes out to talk about the purpose. Now, the purpose of the the purpose of the League of Struggle for Negro Rights is to organize and carry on the various forms of education and action necessary to support the principles set forth and is preamble to win a large following for those principles to secure enforcement of the proposal and demands listing in its program for liberation struggles of oppressed Negro people in all countries. All right. <clears throat> It calls upon Negro and white tolerators to carry through a joint struggle for realization of their everyday needs and demands. The lead of struggle for Negro rights declared that the Negro masses in the United States, by reason of their advantage of environment, living in living in the most highly industrialized capitalist country in the world, have a great responsibility in giving assistance to the Negro people in other countries. Therefore, the League of Struggle for Negro Rights is committed to uncompromising and continuously support the to the liberation movement of the Negro masses throughout the world for complete independence for the equal rights for the oppressed Negro. The lead of struggle for Negro rights aims to achieve its purpose through yeah, its purpose through cooperative and sympathetic alliance of white people. It carries on a day-to-day -day fight against Negro discrimination, police brutality, lynching, and all the cruelties to which Negroes are subjected. It attributes the oppression of Negro people and the working class to the capitalist class. One of the chief purpose of this organization is the winning of social, economic, and political equality for Negro people of America. Also, the right of Negroes in the South, Black Belt region where Negroes are a majority of population to set up their own government. This establishment, this establishing a condition marking a new era in American history. The, the league was founded September 30th of 1930 at the convention in St. Louis. The forum of the organization, among other things, is followed as Federation of Organizations plus membership branches, works for a trade unit organization of Negroes, sponsor anti-lynch and civil rights bill, and fundamental policy adhered to recognize leadership of working class as historically progressive social Social for in present period. So some of the letters are cut off on here. Let's see. Okay, I can't zoom in anymore. But anyways, it says the following are the officers of the association and only white executive of the league is Robert Minor of the vice president of the organization, Lanston Hughes is the president, Robert Minor, vice president, James W. Ford, vice president, Harry Haywood, general secretary, A.W. Berry, 
Ben Davis Jr., editor, Negro Liberation, William L. Patterson, Miss Jessica Henderson. All right, it says the present headquarters is 415 Lenox Avenue, New York City. It is non-political and its members are composed of both Negro and white persons who belong to the Republican, Democratic, and Socialist and Communist parties. All right. So as you can see, the, the, the League of Struggle for Negro Rights was a nonpartisan organization, meaning that they was not just dedicated to just one particular political party. Yes, they had communist views and communist ideas, but they allowed other parties such as Democrat, Republicans, and those who were socialists and those who were communists all to come together in one room. And they also had some whites who were alliance or allies that supported rights for African-Americans and black people in general. So they were also a part of that organization as well. Again, these, this organization and the National Negro Congress was the predecessor of the Revolutionary Black Organization, the um, SNCC, which is the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee, and also the SCLC, which is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. They came before these organizations even came about. And the concept of the civil rights was already in place, okay, before even Dr. King came into the picture in the scene. Before there was a civil rights act, there was already a civil rights movement going on back then. But it was not really brought on the mainstream level until Dr. King came into the picture. And that's when it was starting to become more recognizable in the mainstream. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start right here. And I'm going to take a look at who was Harry Haywood. In just a moment, pull up his information. All right, so let's look at who Harry Haywood was. All right, so Harry Haywood. Harry Haywood was born February the 6th, 1898. Okay, well, some source says February the 4th. Um, and he died in January of 1985. Okay, he was 86 years old. He was a leading figure in both the Communist Party of the United States and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. His goal was to connect the political philosophy of the Communist Party with the issues of race. Now, it says in 1936, he joined other African-American communists and traveled to the Soviet Union to study the effect of communism on racial issues found in the United States. His work, his work there resulted in his selection to be the head of the Communist Party's Negro Department. The party platform changed by the late 1930s and began to stray away from advocating for African-American self-determination. As the party platform changed, over time, Haywood lost his stance with the party. His case, his work also included creating a group to help the Scott Barrow Boys case. Haywood was also an author. His first book was Negro Liberation, published in 1948. After he was expelled from his affiliated party, he wrote an autobiography called Black Bolshevik, which was also published in 1978. He contributed major theory to Marxist thinking on the national question of African Americans in the United States. He was also a founder of the Mayo Mayoist New Communist Movement. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna have to look into that the Mayo the Mayoist New Communist Movement. All right. Hmm. Let me look at this for a moment. Okay, so now let's look at his biography. Uh, so Harry Haywood was born Haywood Hall Jr. on February 4th, 1898 in South 
Omaha, Nebraska to former slaves Harriet and Haywood Hall from Missouri and West Tennessee, respectively. They had migrated to Omaha because of jobs within railroads and meatpacking industry, as did numerous other Southern blacks. South Omaha also attracted white immigrants and ethnic Irish had established an early neighborhood there. Haywood was the youngest of three sons. Okay, so it goes on to say in 1913, after their father was attacked by whites, the Hall family moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota. Two years later, in 1915, they moved to Chicago. During World War One, he served with the 8th Regiment, a black United States regiment. Upon his return to Chicago, the young Hall was radicalized by the bitter red summer of 1919, especially the, the Chicago race riot in which mostly ethnic Irish attacked blacks on the south side. OK, Hall was influenced by his older brother, Otto, who joined the Communist Party in 1921 and invited Hall to enter the secret African blood brotherhood. He was also influenced by theories he read on read of in Vidimir Lenin's State and Revolution as a teen. He stated in his autobiography, Black Bolshevik, that his that this work was the single most important book I had read in the entire three years of my political search and was decisive in leading me to the Communist Party. All right. So it goes on to talk about his career with the Communist Party. All right. Harry Haywood began his revolutionary career by joining the African Blood Brotherhood in 1922, followed by the Young Communist League in 1923. Soon after, in 1925, he joined the Communist Party USA. After joining the Communist Party USA, Haywood went to Moscow to study. And it was on his passport application that he first adopted the pseudonym Harry Haywood, deriving it from the first names of his mother and father. In Moscow, he studied first at Communist University of the Tollers of the East in 1925, then at the International Lenin School in 1927. The anti-colonial revolutionary he met while in Moscow included Vietnamese leader Ho Chi Minh. He began to advocate for African-Americans concern, arguing that they were captives in the United States and that they must embrace nationalism in order to avoid the harmful effect of integration. He stayed until 1930 as a delegate to the Communist International. There, he worked on commissions dealing with the question of African Americans in the United States, as well as the de development of the Native Republic thesis for the South African Communist Party. Haywood worked to draft the com common intern resolution on the Negro question of 1928 and 1930, which say that African-Americans in the southern part of the United States made of an oppressed nation with the rights of self-determination up to and including Caesar session. He would continue to fight for this position throughout his life. Now, in the Communist Party of the United States, Haywood served on the Central Committee from 1927 to 1938 and on the Polit Polybrew, Polybrew, yeah, Polybrew from 1931 until 1938. He also participated in the major fashional struggles internal to the Communist Party of the United States of America against Jay Lovestone and Earl Broder, regularly siding with William Z. Foster. Haywood was a General Secretary of the League of the Struggle for Negro Rights, but he was active in issues involving working class whites as well. In the early 1930s, while head of the Communist Party USA Negro Department, he led the movement to support the Scott Boroughs Boys Organized Miners in West Virginia with the National Miners Union and was a leader in the struggles for the militant sharecroppers union in the Deep South. In 1935, he led the hands of Ethiopia campaign in Chicago's Black Southside to oppose Italy's invasion of Ethiopia when 11 communist leaders were tried under the Smith Act in 1949. Haywood was assigned the task of research for the, the defense. Okay, so... All right, so 
I'm not going to go too long on this, so I'm just going to have to skip some things. Okay. But I just wanted to kind of just introduce who Harry Haywood was. And it says in his book, The Negro Liberation, published in 1948, was the first major study of African-American national question written by African-American Marxists. According to Haywood in his autobiography, uh, Paul Robeson subsidized his work on the project by offering $100 a month. It was translated and published in Russian, Polish, German, Czech, and Hungarian. It was reprinted in 1976 by Liberated Press, the publishing arm of the October League. The heart of this position is that the problem is fundamentally a question of an oppressed nation with full rights of self-determination. It emphasized the revolutionary essence of the struggle for black equality arising from the fact that the special oppression of black is a main prop of the system of imperialist domination over the entire working class and the masses of exploited American people. Therefore, the struggle for black liberation is a component part of the struggle for proletarian revolution. It is the historic task of the working class movement as it advances on the road to socialism to solve the problem of land and freedom of the black masses. On the other hand, Haywood went on to write what was new in the book was the thorough analysis of the concrete conditions of black people in post-war period. I made extensive use of population data, the 1940 census, the 1947 plantation count, and other sources in order to show that the present-day condition affirmed the exceptional correctness of the position we had formulated years before. Because of this and other works, Robert F. William called Harry Haywood one of the modern pioneers in the Black liberation struggle. Okay, so skip on down so his death uh haywood died in january of 1985 was buried in arlington national cemetery in arlington virginia okay he had a service related disability and spent the last few years of his life at a veteran administration medical facility the harry haywood papers are housed at the bentley historical library university of michigan and harbor michigan and at the manuscript archives and rare books division Schwanberg center for research and black culture new york public library new york city and richard's right autobiographical novel black boy the character of buddy nelson is said to be representing haywood so that's the picture of Harry Haywood right here. Okay. That's him. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate that, brother Anthony. I really do. So Harry Haywood was like the Huey Newton of his time. So before Huey Newton came into the picture, it was Harry Haywood who came up with all these social philosophy. He was very political and he was very powerful. Okay. So now it doesn't speak much about his educational life. However, it does speak on that he served in the military. So he had some military experience and he used that in, to enforce his political ideas. Okay, so he took what he learned from the military and then he started studying about social political groups. He start he started studying about social class, uh different economic groups, right? And one of the things he studied on was socialism and communism. So he infused that together. So this man was very brilliant in his own way. He had some brilliant ideas, but again, just like any other individuals, he have not received enough mainstream recognition and has gone, has gone, um, I wouldn't say he has gone on song, but he has gone unnoticed. So he became unnoticed to a lot of us in the black community. So yeah, I just wanted to put his information out there for a little bit, but let's go ahead and go to the National Negro Congress. All right. All right, then let's go ahead and go to the next thing. So the National Negro Congress, who were they? And how did they come into the picture? 
I hope you guys can see the screen. It's so cool. Okay. So now the introduction, let's read the introduction. The National Negro Congress, which was formed in 1936 and disbanded in 1946 at Howard University as a broadly based organization with the goal of fighting for black liberation. It was the successor of the League of Struggle for Negro Rights, both, both affiliated with the Communist Party. During the Great Depression, the party worked in the United States to unite black and white workers and intellectuals in the fight for racial justice. This period presented the, the party's peak of prestige in African-American community. NNC was opposed to war, fascism, and discrimination, especially racial discrimination during the Great Depression era. A majority of Americans faced immense economic problems. Many lost their job and as a result were forced to live at the margins of society. The crisis highlighted inequities for many African Americans who were unemployed at higher rates than whites. Historically, many black workers were segregated and more often than not racially discriminated in labor force. In order to combat racism with their respective jobs, they had to establish a union. However, many of the unions around the Depression era had exclusively white members, excluding black African, um, excuse me, excluding African Americans from their protection and benefits. Black workers took initiative to unite against racism and classism. John P. David, a communist leader, and communist leader James W. Ford decided to bring together meaningful organization that would be dedicated in the ongoing fight against racial discrimination. Class that does not embody one particular race, but transcends racial borders to integrate many ethnic groups alike to face a similar struggle, a class struggle. All right. Okay, so let's look at the history. So now the history, the, fo the foundation of the National Negro Congress was a response to the historical oppression African-Americans face in the United States, in particular in the workforce. Given that black workers have been historically marginalized by exploited from the time when they were enslaved, the National Negro Congress advocated for black liberation through through the many sectors of the African-American life. The NNC, as Jillman de demonstrates, launched a broad and multifaceted assault on race, racism and economic exploitation. Forging alliance with organized labor, the Communist Party and even mainstream civil rights groups, the NNC not only grew, not only drew on the talents and resources of a cross-section of organization, but also established a blueprint. Gilman contends for a subsequent generation of black activists. Though the NNC coordinate activities with an array group, array of groups it forged. Participants included intellectuals from Howard University, civic and civil rights leaders, labor leaders, and religious groups, white participant was not excluded. Black workers affiliated with the National Negro Congress advocated for integration into the larger and better funded unions, such as the CIO. Although the CIO supported the foundation of the National Negro Congress to fight for civil rights and against racism, the communist aspect of the Congress de deprived both organizations from having strong ties to each other. During the late 1930s, and 1940s, despite the efforts of the National Negro Congress and other re reactionary forces operating in the interest of capital increase, their attacks on the CIO, the most backward anti-communist propaganda was directed at the CIO. This was more complex by organ organized labor's positive relationship with Franklin D. Roosevelt and his support of his policy concern World War II. Hmm. Okay, so just out of curiosity, what is the CIO?
Okay, so the CIO is the Congress of Industrial Organization. All right. There were there developed a division between those who supported communism, including its fights on behalf of African Americans, those who only supported civil rights. With the loss of support from the CIO and F and AFL, African Americans were excluded from major unions. With the emergence of the National Negro Congress, the African American community found refuge with activists identified as communists. Even with having a safe space to discuss about class struggle, black workers did not have a radical union that took a stand against capital within the race framework. In spite of not having the support of the AFL or the C. I.O., they rely upon the militancy and communist-led organization of the NNC. Aside from challenging the concept of racism, members of the National Negro Congress advocated against the fascism abroad and the New Deal in the United States. Mm. All right. So it says the election of Franklin D. Roosevelt resulted in a huge economic, political, and social reform over the, over the succeeding years. With the implementation of the New Deal, many African Americans in North believed they had elected a new leader whose ideals were seen radical. However, most of these programs did not have in any say or input of the African American community. Well, what? How interesting is that? All right, so. I'm going to go ahead and read this part, then I'm going to skip it. It says, because of the extensive disenfranchisement of African Americans in the South, the powerful Southern bloc in Congress represented only their white constituents. The black community from different sectors of the community began to form their own institution to address issues that pertain within the black experience. The National Negro Congress consisted mainly of blacks, but not exclusively. In the course of discussion at the Joint Committee on National Recovery Conference in May of 1935 on the economic status of African Americans under the New Deal, John P. Davis and Communist Party activist James W. Ford expressed the need to consolidate the strength of desperate organization dedicated to fighting racial discrimination. All right. The JCNR, which is the Joint Committee on National Recovery Conference, concluded by forming a committee of 60 prominent activists charged with organizing a National Negro Congress the following year. All right. And it goes on to say in February 1936, the first national meeting of the Congress was held in Chicago. It was a confluence of civic and civil rights, labor and religious groups from across the nation, over 800 delegates representing 551 organizations and between 3,000 and 5,000 constituents attended a Ralph a Philip Ralph a Ralph Philip excuse me a Philip Ralph Randolph was elected president and John P Davis was elected national secretary in keeping their popular front orientation the communists in attendance did not attempt to hide their affiliation but consciously deferred to non-communist delegates all right so let's look at who, who these two guys were. So as you can see, John P. Davis. Let's look at who John P. Davis were. All right. That's John P. Davis right there. Who was he? So he was born on January 19, 1905. He died September 11, 1973. Okay. Uh, he was an American journalist, lawyer, activist, intellectual who became prominent for his work with the Joint Committee on the National Recovery. And in 1935, he co-founded the National Negro Congress in an organization dedicated to the advancement of African-Americans during the Great Depression. All right. So he found in 1946, he founded Our World Magazine, a full-size nationally distributed publication for African-American readers. He also published the American Negro Reference Book, covering virtually every aspect of African-American life, present, and past. Okay. So he was born in Washington, D.C., the son of Dr. Henry Davis and Julia Davis. His father was a graduate of Howard University and served as principal of Armstrong High School. During World War I, Dr. Davis was appointed as secretary to Dr. 
Emmett J. Scott, Special Assistant to the United States Secretary of War in the 1920s. Dr. Davis served as Secretary to the Presidential Commission investigating the economic condition in the Virgin Islands. All right. So let's go on and let's skip down a little bit. Okay, it says that he attended segregated schools in Washington, D.C., graduated from elite Dunbar High School, which stressed an academic curriculum in 1922, enrolled in Bate College in Lewiston, Maine. He graduated in 1936, earning an A.B. and double honors in English and psychology. At Bates, he was the president of Delta Sigma Rho, an unnary debating fraternity, and And an editor of the student publication, The Bob Bobcat, he enlisted the aid of Bates trustee, Louis B. Costello, when Delta Sigma Rose National Council denied him membership because of his race. All right. So he toured, he toured Europe with the Bates College debating team. He was amongst the first African-American men to be seen to send overseas under the auspices of the, the American University Union to engage in international debate. His team from Bates met and defeated Cambridge University. While an undergraduate at Bates College, Davis was nominated for a Rhodes Scholarship. He contributed short stories to the Crisis Official Magazine of the NAACP and Opportunity, a journal of Negro Life published by the National Urban League. His short story, The Overcoat, was a prize winner in Opportunities 1926 to 1927 Literary Contest. Okay. All right, so David had a fellowship to Harvard University from 1926 to 1927 and, he, and earned his master's degree in journalism. He left Harvard to join the staff of Fisk University, a historically black college in Nashville, where he served as director of publicity from 1927 to 1928. He returned to Harvard University and earned an LLB degree from Harvard Law School in 1933. All right. OK, so. We're not going to go into his personal life because I got to. All right, let's go down to how he joined the Committee on National Recovery. So in the summer of 1933, John P. David, a law graduate, and Robert C. Weaver, a doctoral student at Harvard, acted to ensure that African-American interests were represented in gov government programs. The two men returned to Washington, D.C. and established an office on Capitol Hill where they fought successfully against the racial wage di differential and for the integration of Negro families into the program of the Homestead Subsistence Division in the first recovery program. Davis and Weaver organized the National Industrial League to pressure New Deal Agency to address the needs of Blacks. They monitored the hearings of the National Recovery Administration to ensure that Blacks benefit from the program. The effort led to the establishment of the Joint Committee on the National Recovery, a group of 26 national groups, including the YWCA, the National Urban League, and the National Association for the Investment of Colored People. Davis became Executive Secretary of the JCNR and position he held until 1936, serving as the legislative lobbyist. The committee lobbied for fair inclusion of African Americans in government sponsored programs. It publicized incidents and patterns of racial discrimination, the implementation of a national recovery program promised to have immediate and long-term consequence for African-Americans. While Davis and Weaver worked, more established, more established African-American leaders deliberated about how to respond to the flurry of New Deal legislation. All right, so here is the National Negro Congress. So in May of 1935, a conference on the economic status of the Negro was held at Howard University in Washington, D.C., out of which emerged a major civil rights coalition that was active in the 1930s and 1940s. The National Negro Congress, whose sponsors include Davis, Ralph J. 
Bunch and Alan Locke of Howard University, A. Philip Randolph of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, Jane Ford of the Communist Party USA, Lester Grand Granger and Elmer Carter of the Urban League, and Charles Hampton Houston of the NAACP. Davis was one of the original founders. He served as the executive secretary until 1942. All right, so. And it says the NNC represent one of the first efforts of, of the 20th century to bring together under one umbrella black secular leaders, preachers, labor organizers, workers, businessmen, radicals, and professional politicians within the assumption that the common denominator of race could weld together such divergent segments of black society. It was the Communist Party's effort to build support among activists in the black mainstream. The evolution of the NNC dramatized the growing convergence of outlook between communists and activists, black intellectuals that had taken shape in the protests of the early depression years and reached full fruition during the years of the popular front. All right. And so in 1943, Davis brought the first lawsuit challenging segregated schools in Washington, D.C. in the name of his five-year-old son, Michael D. Davis, who was rejected from his neighborhood, no school, a white elementary school. The Washington Star newspaper criticized the African-American lawyer for legally changed the district dual segregated school system after the principal of noise school refused to admit Mike Davis. The Washington Star said that the district citizen had long accepted segregated schools for blacks and white and that the suit brought by John P. David would cause deeper racial division in the national in the nation capital. In response to Davis' suit, the U.S. Congress appropriated funds federal funds to construct the Lucy D. Slow Elementary School for African American children directly across the street from his Brooklyn neighborhood home. At that time, a committee of Congress directly administered, di excuse me, administered district government. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna skip, skip, skip. All right, so down here, we're going to go down to what says paper and collection. So the largest collection of Davis paper is in the Schwanberg Center for Research and Black Culture, New York Public Library. Insight into Davis' political and social views can be found in his own writings. The paper of the National Negro Congress reproduces all of the organization's records that are housed at the Schwanberg Center for Research in Black Culture, including the voluminous working files of Davis and successive executive secretaries of the National Negro Congress, beginning with the papers from 1933 that predate the formation of the National Negro Congress, the wide-ranging collection documents involved in the Negro Industrial League. It concludes, it includes the report files of Davis' interest in the Negro problem. The most extensive overview of Davis' life by Hilmar Jensen is in addition of his writings. John Preston Davis, The Forgotten Civil Rights, much of the solidarity writing by Davis focuses on his experience in the National Negro Congress. Artifacts and paper of Davis are being acquired by the Smithsonian Institution National Museum of African American History and Culture. All right, so and here is more information. The reference is at the bottom of the page. Ooh. All right, and then you got the further reading, and that's that. So now let's go and let's find out who is uh, James W. Ford. All right, so right here, this is James W. Ford over here on the right-hand corner, the man with that perm in his hair. Because, you know, they used to wear perms back then. That's him right there on that right-hand corner. Okay. So I'm not going to go too much into his biography like that, but I'm going to read a little something. It says James W. Ford, who was, was an activist and a politician, the vice presidential candidate for the 
Communist Party of the United States in 1932, 1936, and 1940. A party organizer born in Alabama and living in New York City, Ford was the first African American to run on a presidential ticket in the 20th century. James W. Ford was born in Pratt City, Alabama on December 22nd, 1893, the son of Lemon Forge and his wife. His father, a former resident of Gainesville, Georgia, had come to Alabama in the 1890s to work in the coal mines and steel mills. He worked for 35 years as a coal miner for the Tennessee Coal, Iron, and Railroad Company. James' mother earned additional money for the family as a domestic worker. All right, and he got his first job at 13, working on a railroad track in Inslee, Alabama. He worked his way through high school before attending Fisk University. Okay, he joined the Army. All right, he returned to America in which a black man with telecommunication skill was deemed unemployable in his profession because of racism. Many veterans had difficulty finding work soon after the war. Ford ended up taking a job as an unskilled laborer at a mattress factory in Chicago. Okay. All right, so... Let's look at his political career. So in 1935, he was recruited into Chicago session of the American Negro Labor Congress, established by the Communist Party as a mass organization of black workers. The next year, Ford joined the Workers' Communist Party of America itself. All right, as there were few African-American members of the Communist Party in the period, Ford quickly gained recognition as one of the leading black communists in the nation. In 19. 28, Ford was sent to the Soviet Union to represent the American Communist Party at the Fourth World Congress of the Red International of Labor Unions held in Moscow during the March and April. He was elected to the RILU Secretary. Ford did not immediately return to the United States, instead remaining in Moscow to work on the RILU matters as a full-time functionary. Okay. So let's go down to All right, so let's read a little bit more and then I'm going to um yeah, I'm going to log off of here after I get done reading this last part right here. All right, so in 1928, Ford attended the Sixth World Congress of the Communist International on behalf of the American Communist Party, where he was elected to the Common Terms Negro Commission. Ford was also elected a delegate to the 1929 World Congress of the League Against Imperialism, which met in Hamburg, Germany. In J July of 1929, Ford attended, to, attended the 10th and large plenum of the executive committees of the Communist International, at, the, at which he delivered two speeches. Later that month, Ford attended to the Second Congress of the League Against Imperialism, where he was elected to the General Council and the Executive Committee. All right. So, so as you can see, he was very active in the um, Communist Party. And so, yeah, by him being very active within the Communist Party, right, it helped to bring the influence on the uh, Negro, the National Negro Congress because he had a thorough knowledge and he was very, he was the participant and he was just very active. So it helped people like James P. Davis to be able to form these groups. Right. So the point that I'm trying to make is, all right, is that um, these organization, the communist party has been a big influence 
to the African American community. You know what I'm saying? So, and because of the fact that many people subscribe to the philosophy of the Communist Party, especially when it came to the working class people trying to earn their rights because they didn't couldn't do it the way that the United States uh, economic system is or the political system, they figure, all right, well, if we join the Communist Party, then that'll make us, then they'll help us to get our point across. It'll help us to get where we need to be and the status that we need to be as a people. It will help us to fight against racism. That's what they thought back then. So the Communist Party, black people joining the Communist Party was not just started in the 60s. It didn't just start in the 70s. It's been going on since the 30s. OK, so these guys that I'm reading about and the organizations that I'm reading upon, they were around since the 20s and the 30s. So black people been joined the communist parties since then. They were they were already joined these left wing groups because they felt that these groups would help them to be more radical and to get their point across about the racial discrimination, especially in the workforce. Right. And they felt like this was the way to combat against classism as well. So it's been around. And as you can see, let me go back to this individual, James W. Ford. James W. Ford happened to be a vice president of the Communist Party USA. So look, real quick, let's look at the Communist Party USA. I don't want to go too much into it. Let's just look at it. Now, let's see what is the Communist Party of the USA? All right. The Communist Party of the USA, officially the Communist Party of the United States of America, is the Communist Party in the United States established in 1919 after a split in the Socialist Party of America following the Russian Revolution. All right. The history of the Communist Party USA is closely related to the American labor movement and the Communist parties worldwide. Initially operating under the underground due to Palmer raids starting in the first Red Scare, the party was influential in American politics in the first half of the 20th century and played a prominent role in the labor movement from the 1920s through the 1940s, becoming known for opposing racism and racial segregation. After sponsoring the defense for the Scott Barrow's boys in 1931, its membership increased during the Great Depression and they played a key role in the Congress of Industrial Organization. The Communist Party USA subsequently declined due to events such as the beginning of the Cold War, the Second Red Scare, and the influence of McCarthyism. Its opposition to the Marshall Plan and the Truman, the Truman Doctrine were unpopular with its endorsed candidate Henry A. Wallace, Underperformed in 1948 presidential election, its support for the Soviet Union increasingly alienated it from the rest of the left in the United States in the 1960s. All right, so, oops. So let's see, is it still around to this day? Let's see if it's still around. Yeah, so the Communist Party of United USA is still around. Okay, it's still around. So it started in 1919. Okay. But just to get a general idea of what it is, uh, I'm gonna be coming back to this topic later, you know, in a later video, but I just want to kind of just Put that out there or what the Communist Party is. So the Communist Party, basically, they had the influence of rebelling against the government, but in the sense of the workers having more right, the oppressed groups having more right to speak and say so and overthrowing the um, economic system and uh, breaking down the, rac the racial barriers and fighting just against discrimination altogether. Uh, so, so one of these days, I'm going to go into more details about the Blacks and Communist Parties and Socialist Parties. Yep, so I'll have to do that another time. 
I have to do that another time because that's going to be a whole other topic. All right. So anyways, with that being said, let me go ahead and read this. So I'm going to put, I haven't done any research to back my opinion, but looking back, I don't think the segregated schools was the best strategy for blacks. I attend the communist function in my area. A close relative is a member. You know, I used to go to a communist event where these group of people called themselves the Communist Party. Um, I'm trying to think of what the guy's name is because he was he was not a part of this Communist Party, but um, he was around when the Black Panthers came around. Let me let me find out what his name is. Let me see. Is it New Communist Party? Thing was yes okay so the the communist party that i've been around was they called themselves the revolutionary communist party and it started by a guy named bob of vatican bob of vatican as a matter of fact i have some of his um uh, i think i have some of his dvds around I don't know if I have some of his book, but I don't think I have his book, though. But anyways, he was around when the Black Panther came about. So, yeah, so the uh, Communist Party event that I've been to is the Revolutionary Communist Party that was founded by Bob of Vatican. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, some of his members was very active. So I don't know if they're still active. I don't know if they're still around to this day. But, yeah, I was. I went there. So, um, I mean, a lot of people don't agree with the concept about the desegregation, but you got to look at it back in the time period. At that time, the reason why they was for desegregation is because black people were not getting the best education quality like their white counterparts. So you got to remember the poor conditioning of the schools, right? The poor textbook. And remember, black people were not at that higher economic class. Okay, cool. Uh, black people were not at the higher economic class. So with that being said, because they were not at the top class, they had to do what it was necessary for them to get the uh, best education quality and best job. So they figure, OK, since we're not making enough economically as a group, we might as well just go ahead and integrate so that way we can be able to have equal amount of wages, uh, equal amount of education and be able to have fair housing, and et cetera. So this is how they thought back then. But they didn't think that it was going to make the matter even worse or it wasn't going to really change much they thought that that was the way to go about changing is to integrate you know so that's why a lot of our ancestors did things back then and they had their reason doing it but for our generation we may not understand it we may not get the logic we may just think that okay it should have never been done like that it should never been it should have been this way they were wrong etc yeah, we can have those opinions, but at the same time, if we was living in their era, in their time period, then we'll be able to see that, okay, I get why they want to do this. I get why they create these organizations. I get why they want to uh, go to these facilities and be integrated because you have to look at their condition at that time. So... Right, exactly. The poor conditioning. So they figure because of the poor conditioning and the environment, the only way they can have a better conditioning is the equity. So they was looking at the equity part of it. So they said, all right, maybe if we go ahead and integrate ourselves, we would get better quality of um, 
better conditions, better environment, better education, etc. So that's how they thought back then. You know. <clears throat> but all right, but thank you guys for tuning in. Put a lot of black teachers lost jobs once integration took place. White students weren't integrated into black schools. Of course, you of course you know white kids weren't gonna integrate into black schools. No. You know, their parents weren't gonna have that. No. No, the parents was not gonna have they was they was not gonna have their kids going to a school where a bunch of black folks is at. No. Let alone the white parents didn't even want the black kids coming to the school where their kids was at. So no, they would, you know, them white folks was gonna fight about it back then. Nah, they didn't want that, of course. Yep. Yeah, they unfortunately did. It happened. Yeah, a lot of them did lose their jobs, but you know. But anyways, you guys. Uh, thank you all for watching, for tuning in, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And if you guys want to share my video, please do so. Make sure you share the video. Make sure you hit the notification bell, subscribe to the channel, and all that great stuff. And thank you guys for those of you who are new subscribers on my channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That really means a lot. So, Go ahead and share the video, hit the notification bell when I come on, uh, like the channel and all that great stuff. And also make sure you check out Team Osiris. They doing their thing. Check out uh, Brother Kansu, Brother Ngozi. Um, you can check out the Mazi Warrior Clans. Check out, um, Ka what's it, Kofi Pazai TV. Um, check out uh, NBK, New, New Black Knowledge. Uh, they have some phenomenal information on their page, so please check them out. They have a lot of information. Whatever I did not cover on this channel, you can go find it on their channel. So, yeah, they have a lot of information pertaining to black history, and they go into more details than I do. All right. <laughs> but anyways, you guys, um, thank you all for watching, and I hope you all have a wonderful day, and please be safe during this pandemic. Um Let's not get our hopes too high because they got these vaccines out. So now it's saying people taking vaccine and thinking that, hey, we good to go. Don't get your hopes too high. Be careful still. You know, you got to still be mindful out here. You really got to be mindful because this disease ain't going nowhere. It's a virus. And, you know, a virus mutate itself. It don't go anywhere. It doesn't die or nothing. It just know how to mutate. It knows how to transform into something else. Just saying. But all right. Until next time. Peace. Thank you.